A colleague at work asked me the other day, physically, how do you feel to be a Pompeii patient? And I had to think about it for a while because there's a whole heap of various ways in which Pompeii manifests itself in our day-to-day -day existence. And the answer I finally came up with was, you know when you've been sick with the flu, you've been in bed for about two or three days, and you think, I'm feeling a bit better now, I'll get up. You might make it to the lounge room, you might make it to the kitchen, and then you're totally exhausted and can't go any further. That's for me what it feels like. I'm one of four siblings. I'm a middle child. My older brother Peter also has Pompeii. My older sister, who's 65, doesn't. My younger brother, who's 57, Lee, doesn't. My diagnosis is really my older brother's story. Uh, he was found unconscious in his car. He was on his way to Lawn Bowles. They took him to hospital. They put him on oxygen and basically killed him and then revived him because they pushed his carbon dioxide level through the ceiling. Um, he was in intensive care for three or four weeks. At Nara, they then transferred him to Sydney where he continued to be in intensive care while they sought to try and stabilise him. Uh, and work out exactly what was happening for him. Finally, after about six weeks, they did a muscle biopsy or a series of muscle biopsies, which showed that he had Pompeii. Um, fortunately for me, that meant all I had to do was do a blood spot test. But when I look back and um, try and think what were my earliest symptoms, my earliest memory, and I don't know if it's related, uh, but it was when I was about six and I went to a school, uh, Sunday school picnic. They had a cross country race. I remember saying to my mother, I must have won, there's no one behind me. <laughs> now, whether that was an early Pompeii symptom, I don't know. I had a normal adolescence. I did a lot of sport, I played judo at tournament level, I played football, I sailed, and I guess my earliest recollection of having significant symptoms was probably in my late 30s or early 40s, when I'd be on a boogie board waiting for a wave out the back, and I couldn't lie down on the board and breathe. I had to get off the board and tread water beside it until the wave came. I then found out a few years after that when I'd be snorkeling or spearfishing, I couldn't float on my stomach and breathe at the same time through the snorkel. I couldn't get my breath in and had to get out of the water. About six years ago, I was getting incredibly tired at work falling asleep at my desk, falling off my chair, falling asleep while driving. Um, I went to the doctors and they put me through a sleep study and diagnosed me with sleep apnea. Uh, my test showed I was stopping breathing over 150 times in a night, often for over 30 seconds at a time. The doctor said, frankly, you shouldn't be here. Um, and when I think about what happened when I was driving, waking up looking at fronts of semi-trailers and gum trees rushing towards me, probably I shouldn't be here. After my brother was diagnosed and I had my blood spot analysis, which was about uh, a bit over a year and a half ago, two years ago, and both my brother and I were diagnosed too late to get on the compassionate program. Um, I was placed on BiPAP through Victorian Respiration Centre. So with neither of us having access to treatment, I guess I'll try and gauge my progress somewhere with my brother who was diagnosed before I was. and He's had symptoms for a long, long time. Uh, he's had lordosis and uh, the duck waddle, 
probably for about 15 years. Uh, whereas I've only recently started to develop a weakness in my hips and legs that have started to give me some sort of a pronounced walk. My respiration has been the main issue for me and I probably spend between seven to ten hours a day on a BiPAP and often use a depression up and when I'm at work I also have a BiPAP, well not a BiPAP machine but uh, that's one they use for people with um, tracheotomies or when they put on the back of wheelchairs. I have one of those on my desk with like a hooker pipe arrangement so I can uh, spend about 10 minutes on that and suck in a few breaths and try and clean out a bit of carbon dioxide. Um, I also wear a medical bracelet and on that I have the fact that I'm CO2 retentive and I'd encourage all of you who haven't got that if you have a problem with CO2 retention to get one because the damage that can be caused to you if uh, you're treated by someone who isn't aware of your condition can be considerable in the short term. How has it affected my life? Fairly significantly, I've got three children, three boys. I'll probably get teary. And a lovely wife, Robin, who I hope you've met. I guess um, I just thought I was getting unfit. How it affected me and my family, I don't know. Did it cause my depression? Did I have? Did it cause me to be angrier? Or have more difficulty in creating relationships because I was tired or distracted or not having a clear thought process at times? I don't know. Has it caused problems now? Yes, certainly. My wife has had to take on a lot more. Uh, she does the boy things now. She mows the lawns. Uh, we've had to get her a lightweight electric screwdriver so she can do some of the handyman stuff. Uh, thank God for riding on mowers, I'll tell you that anyway. Um, she's a bit of a superwoman, really. Um, just so I don't want to miss anything here. I guess one of the things I didn't know was that Pompeii creeps up on you. In exactly the same way as the storage of the life of long sounds in the cell uh, gradually decreases your muscle ability. You don't know whether it's Pompeii's or whether it's old age, and if you don't know you have Pompeii, you think you're just getting old. Uh, we went to Europe a few years ago. I guess about five or six years ago, I started having a problem walking upstairs. I thought, eh, I'm just getting old. Well, if you've been to Europe, you know how many bloody stairs there are. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's stairs. Well, let me tell you, there's also elevators. I found one even in the Colosseum. <laughs> but as we walked over places like the Palatine Hills or the walls of the Brodnik, I would stop every 50 metres and say to my wife, look at that, <laughs> look at that, just to try and get my breath. And she'd say, I told you to bloody train for walking before we got here. <laughs> um, so what lies ahead? I don't know. My respiration, I feel it's gotten a bit worse. But I don't think it has. The testing I've had, I was tested 18 months ago, I was tested again about two months ago. They've said there's been very little change in my respiration. Certainly my mobility has changed. Whether that's due to inactivity and I need to do more exercise to tone up, I don't know. But certainly I'll take on board everything I've heard here in the last two days because it's given me an opportunity to experience a lot more information that we're not aware of and there's a lot to be done in getting that information out there. Um, how will it affect me as I go on? I'm scared of things now, I'm scared of the burden that I may be. I'm scared, I'm scared of getting a cold. 
how am I going to breathe on a respirator if I've got an infection or if my, I find even if my nose is stuffy, I can't get enough air in to get the carbon dioxide out of my body when I'm awake and I get more tired more quickly. I'm scared that I won't be able to do the simple things like see my grandchildren, spend some retirement. Maybe enjoy replacement therapy will do that for me. I don't know. I hope so. Um, I guess someone at work said to me, life's too short. I always try to remember what Billy Connolly said, it's the longest bloody thing you'll ever do, mate. <laughs> so, in short, I'm going to live and try and live as much as I can in the time I've got enzyme therapy or not regardless. But I'm not going to wait for death, which I think can be a trap we can fall into. I think we just have to get out there, do what we can, take on board everything that we've been able to hear here today and push forward and make sure that we get retreatment for those who deserve it and those who can need it and for those to come. And thank you all.